Welcome to Podcast on Wheels, powered by Power Loops. Today, we have a very special guest, and Coach Burt here with us today. He's a visionary leader. He has the greatness factory. He's a prey drive expert, championship coach. He was the youngest head coach leading Riverdale High School to success, best-selling author, empire building, and over 20 years of experience empowering top performers to achieve greatness. Coach Burt, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, and... Uh most unique podcast studio I've ever been in. That is a huge so, compliment. Thank and you. Uh, my mind immediately goes to all the ways this could be utilized. Right. So uh, congratulations on coming up with something new. Thank you. Novel, different. Mm -hmm. Part of being a person of interest is create creating things. New, novel, different. Right. It's like Walt Disney walked in and said, "I want to make something different, better, and more magical." Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of being a person of interest. Greatness Factory is new. It's novel. It's yeah. different. Yeah. Adds on to what was here before. So, you know, this is a, I could hang, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I'd go back to work if I'd just hang out <laughs> over here. It's, but it's very cool. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. Coach, you, you, you're, you're open book, you're consistent, and a, and a lot of things that you say, but I really enjoyed hearing the stories that when I've heard you speak, and, and I've heard you a few times. I don't know if you can see me way back in the corner, yep. but, uh, but there's some stories that you tell about when you were coaching your basketball team yep. and how you built that. Can you take us back there and enlighten me? When I was 18 years old, I went to a coaching clinic in Nashville with the great Don Meyer, and Don Meyer was... Most people don't know who Don Meyer was, but he coached at a Division three school uh, or NAI school called David Lipscomb University, and he was a machine, man. And he would hold these open coaching clinics, six to 800 coaches, free clinics. And as a young basketball coach at 18, I went and I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is crazy. Like they, the way they pivot, the way they play, everybody's got a notebook. Everybody sits in the front one third of their seat. And he was like, you know, teaching life through basketball and when I saw that I'm like that's what I want to do right this is going to be different so he got me involved with uh, reading S Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People I immediately read that book and go I want to teach my players those seven habits and so it became like I had this university my own little greatness factory where kids came to me and I spent about five and a half hours a day pouring into those kids but it was very advanced thinking seven habits, good to great, five dysfunctions of teams. And the other coaches couldn't understand what I was doing. They would like talk about motivation. Y'all need to be motivated. You need to do this. Where I was actually teaching them how to lead, yeah. how to think. And that became a little greatness factory for me. And over you know 31 years, we won 70, 74.7% of the time. And um, it's where I learned so I tested ideas and it's like a laboratory for me, coaching on my concepts. And it was great. I wouldn't trade I would not trade it for anything. I hear you. I just was reminded when I was coaching college baseball, we had an outfielder. He was a little bit hot headed. Yeah. And he 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 struck out and he comes in the dugout, one of the other coaches said, You need to make an adjustment. And he goes, What adjustment do I need to make? Yep. Yeah. And I heard that and it kinda hit me the way you're saying, like a lot of people talk about, yeah, but how do you explain it to them? Right? So Yeah. Well, they talk about motivation. Right. You need to be more motivated. I had a high school basketball coach that played at the University of Tennessee, and he wasn't a great coach. But he would say to me, Bert, you're too slow. But he wouldn't tell me how to get fast. Right. Right? Like, like when I look back on that, I wish he would have said, come in 30 minutes early. We're going to work on your footwork. Right? You right. got great skills. You can see the floor. You're a great point guard. But I need to, right? He never told me how to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm coaching a CEO of a you know, $20 million company this morning, and he's telling me what he needs his people to do. And I said, well, have they ever had any training? Have they ever had any coaching? Right. No. They don't know how to do it. Yeah. They don't know how to do that. So it's one thing to say, well, you need to get better. You need to get more motivated, and you need to get faster, and you need to figure out how to do this. It's another thing to say, okay, say it like this do it like this, like training coach people. Mm -hmm. And that's from my athletic background. That's really where that comes from. There's not enough training in, in a business. So people are not trained. Right. And I, and I, and we have online Academy and, but I still, I still think we could train a whole lot more than what we do. Jan and I were talking about this morning about onboarding people, because if we onboard people, they need to be trained. Right. And I think, well, we have an online Academy. It's got 228 courses in it. Like that's training, but, but they also need to be trained in 
What do we believe? Why do we believe it? What do we do? What separates me from other coaches? How do you get on the phone and close a person, right? That's training, too, that they need to get. Mm -hmm. So th those are things we're working on as well. So I saw a picture. I think it was the other day of maybe a, a, a young you. You had a birthday just last week, right? Or so, I think. But you said to dress, show up, dress up. Tell me about that. Tell me about where that came from. It, it, well, I was raised by a single mom. Okay. She had me when she was 16. Okay. And I don't, it's like I don't remember a lot of things. And my mom always says, maybe I remember it different than how it happened. And that's called counterfactual thinking is you remember things differently, but that's how I remember it. And what I remember mom doing is being very strict. And I remember her having these sayings, we dress up, we show up, we grow up, we don't whine, we don't complain, we don't make excuses. She wouldn't let me miss a day of school. I was having this discussion with my daughter last night who made like a, I don't know, 81 on a test or something. And sure. They gave her a chance to take it over, and she said, why should I take it over? It's 81, you know. It's a, I'm like, man, when I grew up, my mom, it was all A's. There was no question. It's you're making A's. You don't miss school. You show up, you know. And so a lot of that philosophy was conditioned in me very early in life. I didn't know it. I was just a kid. Right. But it was kind of being conditioned in me. See, when I meet people today that are older, and maybe they don't have discipline, maybe they don't have confidence, Maybe they don't have boldness. Maybe somewhere along the way they didn't get these things, right? Because right. the school system's not going to teach it. A lot of it comes from coaches. Mm -hmm. Like coming up to this baseball field took me back to, I mean, I grew up on a baseball field. Okay. I would stay at a baseball field till 10 o'clock at night as a six-year-old kid with coaches raising me because my mom was working. So my mom would take me to the baseball field. And I'd just say, "Come, go, go do what you got to do. Come back and get me late at night. And I was literally the last one to leave every night. So it was there that I figured out I was going to be a great coach. So that's where these these things that it's hard to describe, it's hard to take that and put that prey drive into a person when it's conditioned into you very early, mm -hmm. right? We look like somebody when we go out of the house. Yeah. Mom used to say, right, what, what happens if you have a wreck and you look like that? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like all these little sayings. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's like I don't know if anybody's going to say that, but yeah. but that's the way I was raised. So you got you got you're raised that way. You go to the big coaches clinic. You're learning. You're growing in the early 20s. I remember when I heard you speak for the first time and, and you know, I enjoyed the story about how you met your wife because yep. that to myself is, you know, it's like she came uh, on a trip yep. and to attend your uh, session yep. and you're like, she said, can I tell you? You're like, absolutely. Yep. I can talk to you for a few yep. minutes. So, yep. and now how long ago was that coach? That was probably shoot 10 or 12 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think people have potential yeah, and other people recognize that potential in you. But think of it as raw, undeveloped potential. This is why people need coaches. It's like it's like there's potential, but the potential has got to be activated Then there's got to be direction to the potential. And so what I did is I've created all these structures to, number one, get a person to want to play at a bigger level. Mm -hmm. That's the activation of the prey drive. Once the prey drive is activated, you're not thinking about having one of these. You're thinking about having a hundred of these. See where I'm going? Mm -hmm. you're, you're thinking, okay, now I want to go play at a bigger frequency. Once that prey drive is activated and then nothing happens until that prey drive is activated, seeing a person can activate that drive. Being in a room with a person that's doing big things can activate that drive. Environments can activate that drive, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think people look at people and go, you got potential. Go see this person and they can help you with that potential, Right. Like yesterday, I, I made a move to, to be on the board of a, of a publicly traded company. And, and uh, my first thought was, man, I need, I need someone to mentor me, right? Like I've been on boards, but I've never been on boards of publicly traded companies. Okay. And it's like this is, a new, this is a new thing. And my first thought was I need to go to somebody who could give me the lay of the land, right? Mm -hmm. What do I need to know? What do I need to do? What can I say? What can I not say? Right. It, it, like this, uh, this is not privately held companies. These are publicly held companies. So right. it's like my first thought is I need a coach, right? And then just go, who, who is that? Who coaches people who are on boards or appointed to boards? So it's like that's why people need a coach because they have this raw, natural talent, and that talent has to be activated. Then it's got to be guided and directed, but millions of people will have that and never even have the knowledge of going to a coach. Mm -hmm. There was a woman at the Greatest Factory today with her husband. He signed up for the coaching. She fought him on it. Um, and it was the first time she's ever been around that. 
And she could very quickly see this guy could help us. It's like she didn't know. Right. I was unaware. Now I'm aware. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think once you're aware, it's like, okay, this, this could help us play at a higher level. Yeah. Have, have, you know, early and then the coaching and now the, you're talking to CEOs, $20 million companies, and you're helping a lot of people coach. Yep. When I've been able to be around you, it, it is, it's like, there is an ability and that you have that I'm trying to kind of gauge when you see something, you're going, okay. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I was talking to my wife the other day and we're having a conversation and she said, you know, to me, she says, I see things further down the road. Sometimes she sees it right here. Yeah. And as I get around guys like you, I'm going, wait, what are they seeing? Yeah. What What's he seeing? So, yeah. it, well, I mean, there's certain gifts that people have. You know, I, I've i taken a lot of tests to ascertain what my exact gifts are, how to utilize those gifts. I don't dabble with them. I'm very serious. I'm not casual with them. Mm -hmm. And one gift I have is the gift of vivid visualization, okay. which means I can see in my mind's eye 50 greatness factories. Okay. Now, that that gift can be used constructively and destructively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't use it constructively, you can go into negative town. Like if I see 50 and I've only got one, you can go from fantasizing, seeing it, to catastrophizing, which is you go all the way to negative town when things don't go the way you want them to. Okay, so it's a gift, but it can be used positive and negatively. I can see on down the road, like, okay, this is where I want to go. Like I can see confidence factories for kids. I can see money labs when I go to places which are cool places people work on ideation. I can see greatness factories. I can see it. Okay, so then I've got to uh, follow that up with physical action. You go from mental creation into physical action. So what I'm always thinking of is, A, what's the NBO? What's my next big opportunity? How do I do this better, easier? I've kind of grinded it out for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, okay, what's the next big opportunity? How do we get there? Who do we need to know? And how do I get out of this cycle into to a bigger, to a bigger mm -hmm. play? Mm -hmm. And teach me a little bit about here. You've You've written 17, 18, 21. 21. Okay. I knew I was trying to count Can't them up. Can't me five okay. or six books. All right. 21. But what did you do different as you started writing books? Because some of them did yeah. a little bit different, yeah. you know? What? Well, in the beginning, I wrote a book because people were asking me, what are you doing? Okay. Which is, which is tells you that you have a monetizable idea. When people are constantly asking you, what are you doing? How are you doing? So the people come watch my teams play and they'd say, gosh, man, those kids, incredible. They're disciplined, chemistry, focus. And then say, well, how are you doing that? And I'd say, well, I ain't got time to explain it. And then so I wrote a book. I had no idea what to do with the book. I didn't know how to publish the book. I didn't know how to market a book. I wasn't talking about bestseller list. I just had a little message, right? And, but oddly enough, unintended, people would, hand the book out to somebody and then I get a, started getting a few calls like will you come speak at this banquet right and I was like sure and I remember I enjoyed preparing I enjoyed the preparation what am I going to talk about I enjoyed the connection to the audience and when I was finished at a little football banquet a little, little big football coach came to me and he said man you're good he said you could go on the circuit mm -hmm. And I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, now, what circuit are you talking about? And he said, you know, around the world and speak. And then he said, I still didn't really understand. And then he said, like Lou Holtz. Hmm. And Lou Holtz was the head coach at Notre Dame. So I go, okay. So I go home and I, I look up Lou Holtz. And Lou Holtz is speaking. He's writing books. And down in the corner said a $100,000 speaking fee for one hour. And I go, man, I think I can do this. <laughs> So I, I write book two, then I write book three, then I write book four. And remember, I'm a high school basketball coach. So I'm obsessed with building this program. It's all I think about. I don't have any friends. I don't have any kids. I don't have, I'm, I'm, I mean, like I don't have anything other than winning. I'm married to winning. And my program was like, this is it. This is all I do. So as I was writing these books, I'd go out and speak on the books. And then people started saying, will you come and speak to my people? And they said, what would it cost me? 
I had no idea what to say. And I remember a guy said, what would it cost me once? And I said, it'd be 350 bucks for three hours. And he said, done. And I go, well, dang, <laughs> I should have asked for a lot more money. Right. And then it gets bigger. I'm still coaching. I'm still building my team. I win a championship. I'm speaking in West Tennessee to a healthcare company, long-term healthcare facilities, which are nursing homes. And it was privately owned, husband and wife. They paid me 1500 bucks for the day. I thought it was big money. They come to me on the break and said, we need to talk to you. It's real serious. And I said, okay, what's going on? I said, we want you to be our coach. We want you to come to West Tennessee once a month for one week and coach our people. And I'm like, well, what is that? look like? And they said, we're going to pay you $12,000 a month, 144000 And I thought, this is crazy. I went home and told my mom. She didn't even believe me. She thought it was like, you know, a scheme. Mm -hmm. She's like, there's no way somebody's going to pay you 144000 to be their coach. And I'm saying, mom, I'm telling you, these people are going to pay me 12000 a month. Now, that's a quantum leap. So I'm making 50000 a year, which comes out, to, I don't know, $2,500, $3,000 a month. It's taxed. I go over here and they say, for one week, we're going to pay you $12,000 for that one week a month. See, that's a quantum leap. I'm like, okay. So that kind of gave me some courage. I'd won a championship, so then I retired. And I started this business, which was, I don't know, I'm 48 now, so 31 years old, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, and that's how it happened. Go speak. I'd go see them. I want you to coach my people. I'd say, what does that look like? And they'd say, well, how much is it going to cost me? Mm -hmm. Right? And it went from, from 75000 to 150000 to 250000 right. you know, all the way up to bigger numbers. Right. And at first, I didn't even know. And what? so guess what that forced me to do? Develop systems, structures, processes. How do I coach people? What is happening in these companies? How much prey drive do they have? So that forced me to come up with methodology to go do it. Right. And that's one thing that, you know, <clears throat> when I have had the pleasure of hearing you, seeing you, and it, it's like, what? Do, do you have situations that you're not prepared for? <laughs> do you? You know what I mean? Like I yes. sit back and I go, yeah, sure, there's things that happen. Course. Like the, of course. the builder or the deal and you had to fly back and get that hit yeah. yeah, there. Things happen. But yeah. But I still think there's somewhere you go, oh, okay, I can just flip over to this, and that's how I'm going to handle this. Yeah. It's just the standard yeah. with you, right? And, it, and it's a, a mindset of we don't lose. Yeah. We learn. And adversity is a, a departure away from an ideal scene. What I do with that adversity, see, if you go all the way back to Covey, who is who I studied under for eight years, everything was stimulus and response. Between stimulus and response is a space. And in that space lies my ability to choose my response. Mm. So all I can control is my, resp uh, is my stimulus. I can't always control the response. So things happen and there's a departure away from the ideal scene. And you go, okay, how am I going to handle this? Am I going to whine about it? Am I going to complain about it? Or am I going to use it to accelerate? process, right? Building a greatness factory from the scratch. There's no doubt that I wasted at least a half a million dollars or a million dollars on building it from people taking advantage of me, of things I didn't know, of technology we didn't need, of, you know, there's no doubt that I made a lot of mistakes doing it, sure. but, but now I know. And I wouldn't have known until I did it. So when I go to do number two or number three or number four, then it's like, we're not going to make that mistake again. Yeah. Step into the future with Power Loops, the king of off-grid power, where our proprietary system is changing the game of energy. This isn't just power, it's freedom. The freedom to live, work, and play anywhere, powered by our innovative technology that taps into the Earth's natural energy. Our system is designed for efficiency, durability, and sustainability, ensuring that you have reliable power 365 days a year without harming the planet. Whether you're traveling in the RV, the remote wilderness, or just opting out of traditional power grids, Power Loops provides the ultimate solution. Join us in leading the charge towards a cleaner, greener, and more empowered world. Power Loops, the king of off-grid energy. Yeah, and that, that's one thing as, thanks again for the compliment on the studio. Yeah. But on the way here today, you know, Man, if we could have known, we could have done this, yeah. and it might have done, That's you know, right. and it's just, we're growing with it. That's so right. um, when you go into work with a team, with a company, 
is it is it different according to the company or is there like how do you, there, how do you there's a formula that i use okay of missing structures and it doesn't matter if it's a startup company to a multi-billion dollar company they all have missing structures mm -hmm. so what i found by going into all these companies banks mortgage companies i spent four years in the prison system uh you know it's like i i, I would take notes everybody struggles with confidence Everybody struggles with this. Every nobody wants to do this, right? And then I would codify it and deconstruct it and go, okay, I'm gonna make build a whole program around it. I'm gonna build a program around confidence. I'm gonna build a program around boldness. I'm gonna build a program around selling, follow-up, conversion, whatever. I would take the problems and convert it into a program and then teach it. And uh, but but listen, every company, no matter how big the company is, has one of six problems. Pray drive, activation can't get people motivated. Mm -hmm. Two, don't know how to explain their value in a compelling way. Three, don't know how to generate leads for the business. Four, don't know how to follow up and convert on those leads. Five, don't know how to engage with people after they've been sold. Or six, they don't know how to become known in the world. So I'll say, which of these problems do you have? Some people go, I got all six problems. <laughs> yeah. I'll say, well, I'm glad you're talking to me. <laughs> right. But the truth is, billion dollar companies have these problems, right? I would coach mortgage companies and I would look at the stats, because remember, I'm a coach, mm -hmm. and I'm a guy of probability, right? Mm -hmm. You were a coach. Yeah. Everything can be broken down to statistical probability, right. okay? Average person is going to buy four to seven homes in their lifetime. Each satisfied person should be worth 5.7 referrals over the lifetime of a consumer. It takes seven to 15 touches 80% of the time to convert a prospect to a buyer. And I would go, are we following up seven times on leads? Nope. We're losing money. Are we following up after we sell a person a house? 98% of people don't. We're losing money. Mm -hmm. Are we getting 5.7 referrals? Nope. We're losing money. If I could quantify how much money you're losing, if you're losing 10 million a year, and I say it's, uh, I can help you recoup that 10 million, and I'd like 500,000, now I'm helping them make money, yeah. and and that makes it easier for me to sell it to them. Right. Because a lot of people see training as a cost. It's an expense. It's like, I don't want to get coaching because it's an expense. Well, we got a state farm agent out of... Uh, I think Wyoming. Jana, is that right? Wyoming. And um, it's like he was going out coaching people. Mm -hmm. He typically made between ten dollars and $15,000 of back-end sales. He comes into my coaching program. He invests twenty k. His next speaking again, he watches some of my videos to get ready. He watches a video that says he should change his offer. He goes and does the exact same thing he's been doing, except he changes the offer based on the coaching. First engagement, he does $150,000. So he's like, 20, I, I paid you 20 on my next engagement. I made 150. Yeah. That's what coaching can do because sometimes we don't know. It's not, it's not like there's something wrong with us. We just don't know what we're not doing. <laughs> Coach, I'm laughing. I, my boys are six and nine. Yep. And my nine year old had a soccer practice the other night and I'm helping coach with the soccer. One of his teammates takes his little Gatorade water bottle, whatever it is, and throws it as high and as far as he can. And it hits and it goes, yeah. and it busts. And he goes, I didn't think that would happen. <laughs> and I thought about you there for a minute. Like, yeah. how would he know better? That's right. If he hasn't been taught. That's right. And he hasn't been coached. That's right. And instead of going, hey, kid, did you not realize? No, he didn't. He didn't. That would be like that coach telling you you're slow. That's right. And not getting there 30 minutes early. But I that's sat right. there for a second. I watched that bottle fly. I'm like, that's going to bust, right? Yep. And it does, and the kid goes, oh, that is, and he loses his water, and we're to practice. And I'm like, I got you another water, kid. You're yeah. fine. But. I thought about you in that moment because it's like, he didn't know. Right. So you just come in and teach and, and coach. Most, right. And most people don't know. Right. They don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And the worst part is it, they don't go seek. They don't go seek out help. So what that does that drives me crazy is it perpetuates a vicious cycle of doing the same thing over and over and over and getting the same results over and over. And it's like, oh my gosh, like, like, see, what was the first thought I had when I didn't know when I was in that meeting yesterday? I need to go get a coach. Mm -hmm. Like, like I'm good, but I need coaching in this very specific area. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's my thought. If I don't know, let me go find somebody who does know. Most people just keep doing it. And so you, you go back and study, I don't think it was Maxwell who come up with this, but unconscious incompetence. Conscious incompetence is I know that I don't know. 
unconscious incompetence is I don't even know what I don't know. Now, and, there, and there's some ignorance to that. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that in a negative way, True. but it's like, you know, when I grew up in a small town, we never went to New York City. We didn't go to Chicago. Mm -hmm. We didn't go to Miami. We didn't go to Los Angeles. I didn't see those places. I went to the same place every year to vacation, right? So you can imagine when I first started traveling the world and I went to New York City and I'm like, ah, oh, look at this opportunity. It's everywhere. I go to Houston, Texas. There's six million people in Houston. Mm -hmm. I go to Miami. I go to, right? Uh, I mean, it's like, then I was in Fort Worth, Texas last week. It's like, look at all this opportunity here. Never, I've never even spent time here. I've never been to Austin, Texas. I've never, so there's like, we get caught up. It's like, oh my gosh, this is hard. And where am I gonna find people? And there's not enough money. And then you get out in the world. It's like, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's like air. That was the guest we've had earlier, uh, Mickey Heider. And he's been in the music business, and baseball business, et cetera. And we were talking about that as he, he said he would bet on people back in the day, a songwriter, an artist. And if they made it, then they, they everybody wins. Yep. Right? So he had to have that vision. He had to be able to see. And we've talked about some things as he talked about out there, but it was a lot of similarities here. Yes. You know, and, and it's not, that's the thing that, that I've been very excited about because as a coach, sure, we had systems, we had, you know, just because you made an out at the plate doesn't mean you didn't have a quality of bat. How, did, how right. did we structure this? What can right. we learn, right? So we tried to teach that way and I've always been that way. But over the last few years, I think the mirror has told me that I may not be doing that. Yeah. And I know that I don't know. That's right. But I'm a little too proud to ask yep. for help sometimes because yep. I'm a man and I'm going to figure this. You That's know right. what I mean? Yep. Like, so obviously you run into that all the time. They, they, they want it, but they don't want it. And they're going to push and do that. But what are some of those stories that you went into that maybe have you ever been surprised when you go help somebody and they go and you're like, wow. Well, I know that there's a high level of probability. There's no way if you have a skill coach that you're not going to get better. Right. Okay. What I see is that people don't know, number one, so they never seek. Number two, they do know, but it's going to cost some money. And they see that as an expense. Mm -hmm. Or they say that's expensive. Now, now, I just gave you an example of a guy who invested $20,000 into his coaching and in the first week made 150000 because of new knowledge. Mm hmm so think of it like this. As we gain new knowledge, we gain new capabilities. But even as you're sitting here thinking about it, there's people that I need to invest in to help me do something, right? I wrote the first 18 books. That I never had a Wall Street Journal bestseller. I had Amazon bestsellers, but I never had. It's a whole nother, it's a whole nother league. Like today, you can sell a bunch of copies on Amazon in a day and nobody's in that category and you call it an Amazon bestseller and sure. kind of pacifies that mm -hmm. if you telling people you're best. But it's not really the big leagues. The big leagues is New York Times bestseller. The big leagues is Wall Street Journal bestseller. So I write, you know, four major published books and I just had I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to sell it. It's not how how well the book is written, although the quality does matter. It's how well the book is marketed and you got to use all these guerrilla marketing techniques to get people to buy the book. So I'm like, all right, I'm making a simple decision for this book to be a Wall Street Journal bestseller or New York Times. I really want to hit New York Times. And, but I don't know how to do it. And so I call, I think Ed Milet, and I'm like, who launched your book, man? It was incredible. Looks like you sold 100,000 copies the first day. And he said, Rory Vaden. And I go, okay. So I go, I pick up the phone. I call Rory Vaden, mm -hmm. who's speaking in my conference, by the way, coming up in September. And I go, man, I want to spend time with Rory Vaden. And they said, it's 18000 for three hours, 35000 for the day, mm -hmm. right? And see, at first, you go, oh, $18,000 for three hours? It's the wrong way to look at this. I didn't know how to do something. Mm -hmm. I could try to do it on my own. I could watch videos, I could watch YouTube, I could, or I could invest the 18,000 to go learn a new capability. So I invest the 18,000, I go spend three hours, he gives me five strategies, the book sells 10,000 units, it hits the Wall Street Journal bestseller. I didn't even know that the book couldn't hit the New York Times because of the publisher I went with. There's certain publishers that it don't matter how many copies you sell, it's not going to be on the New York Times. Okay. They don't like those publishers, whatever. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that. I thought I got a major published book. It's with the major company. I could do this. So that was the first thing that I didn't even know. So he goes, we got to hit the, New or the Wall Street Journal. I said, okay, so we try these strategies. We do the deal. Now, I generate 10,000 leads from selling the book. 
I hit the Wall Street Journal list, which drives up the speaking fees, the revenue, everything. Now, you tell me, was the 18000 an expense or an, an investment? A great investment. Okay, well, I, that's the part that drives me crazy that people can't understand. It's like, I know I want you to be my coach, but it seems expensive. And, and it's like, well, I can't help you. It's not free. What you're really paying for is 33 years of me doing exactly. this. And that comes with... A lot. It's not expensive, but it is not the cheapest. Mm -hmm. And so you got to look at it as, you know, when you go shopping, you can go to Aldi, you can go to Target, you can go to Walmart, you can go to, uh, you know, uh, Publix, or you can go to Whole Foods. Right. And depending on what, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to. It's going to be a different price. That's right. And quality. That's right. Right. I mean, so I saw you uh, really enjoyed the, the post when you were on the cruise and talking about at this level. There's a different level yeah. Yeah. that a lot of people don't get to see, That's experience, right. feel, yeah. right? Yeah. And by you doing that video, I've yeah. been on cruises, but I've never been there. <laughs> and I'm sitting there watching going, I want to go work out with him up there. I want to yeah. go sit at that. I want to go see Sit at the bigger table. Yeah. 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 So tell us about those experiences and, and what about the cruise you could tell us, but tell me what that was yeah. about. Well, it's like the first time I flew private, you know, you don't know what that's like until you do it. Yeah. No waiting lines, no security, no just walk right on the plane and be in the air in seven minutes. It changes you. Mm -hmm. You see a different altitude. You think bigger. With the cruise, I've been on cruises my whole life. I've spoken on probably 20 cruises. I've never stayed up in the suite level. I didn't even I don't even know if I knew it existed. Mm -hmm. And as part of this deal, they wanted me to speak. And I said, look, if you want me to speak, I want it, want it, you know, a nice room, suite, something nice. And they said, done. You know, and so I was up on the 18th level, which was the highest level of the ship. There's a whole nother world. It wasn't like a nicer room. It was like private concierge, oh, your own restaurants, your own swimming pools, your own deck to lay out. Big, huge rooms. You know, it's totally different than what you think of of a cruise, which I'm in this little room. I got this little bathroom and I'm a little guy. But even in a little bit of shower, you got in this one, you got a big bathtub. You got your own freaking bathtub on the cruise. It's like a big hot tub in there. It's like, and I'm like, this is, this is another level. But once you see it, mm -hmm. you're not going back. Well, and from that point forward, now that's going to cost you more money. And so a lot of people go, well, I just, you know, I'll, I'll stay down here and complain about it. I'll be on the cruise. Right. But I'm telling you in life, there's levels. Mm -hmm. You know, first time I went to Bradley's office, I was like, now this marble everywhere, the, this is an office, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, first time I went to and saw Cardone sales team mm -hmm. selling 40, 50 people on the phones. I'm like, this is a sales team, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's like, okay, now that I've seen it, now I know what's possible, mm -hmm. right? It's like, this is a bigger level. And that's what the level people are trying to get to. So the first step of activating the prey drive is to exceed it. Right. If you want to know what a billionaire does every day, shadow a billionaire. Mm -hmm. Go spend a day with a billionaire. And if they say it's ten thousand bucks, it's an interesting thing. I had Jeff Hoffman at my lodge. I had this big lodge out in Christiana, Tennessee, eight thousand square foot lodge, and and uh, Hoffman founded Priceline. It's ninety three billion dollar company. So he's a billionaire. I called it dinner with a billionaire. I couldn't get people to come. I literally couldn't get people to come. I couldn't sell tickets. I was selling tickets at four ninety seven, six ninety seven, and it was in my home city of Murfreesboro, where I live. And I was asking my friends, like, "This is crazy. I'm bringing a freaking billionaire in. He's going to spend time on a Saturday night teaching people how he became a billionaire." I paid the guy to come, and I couldn't sell tickets to it. And I asked one of my friends, "It's like, what is the problem here?" And he's like, "Man, people can't even see themselves being." A millionaire, mm -hmm. let alone a billionaire. So far out of their realm of thinking, they don't even think it's possible. Mm -hmm. So why go listen to one? I'm thinking, who wouldn't want to hear this? So frustrating. Mm -hmm. So people have these limitations. What I try to do is teach people, if, if he's doing it, you can do it. If somebody else is doing it, it's possible, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Bannister, nobody run the four-minute mile until Bannister... And then everybody runs a four minute mile. Not me. I'm not running a four minute mile, but I'm saying yeah. it's like he opened up this thing, right? It's like this is possible. The, you know, the number one thing people said to me about the Greatness Factory? You said you were going to do it, and by God, you did it. 
I've been talking about things I was going to do for years and I still haven't done them. Right. That means something to people. You say you're going to do something, you put your mind to it and you see it through to its conclusion. And that is a habit of the top 1%. See things through to their conclusion. You don't live in ideas. You live in execution. So there's something that I've heard you say several times, and I wanted to get it on this show. So I'm going to make a special request here that there's you. you I've heard it not with the execution part at the end. Yeah. But there's some simple minded people that are here. There's some people here and they're talking about different things. So you, you, you follow me what I'm asking here. Yeah. So. How do you say that? That they talk about ideas, they talk about yeah. Ideas. I, how, well, how? I think I think a guy named Ben Wilson gave me that. I was coaching him, and Ben wanted to make five million a year, mm -hmm. so he could give away a million. So mm -hmm. this is my goal. I need to make five million, so I give a million away to charity. It's okay. And one day he said to me, uh, "Small time people get together and talk about other people. Mm -hmm. Next level up gets together and talk about events." things that happened in the past. You mm -hmm. go to the football game, you see the news, you see what, what happened at the debate. Big time people get together and talk about ideas. This is how we're gonna make money. This is how we're gonna do it. But super big time people get together and talk about execution. Like, let's go, let's quit talking and let's move. And, they, and, and that's four levels of people, mm -hmm. right? And so just think about how much time is spent talking about other people, worrying about other people, thinking about other people. And then how much time is spent in, okay, this is how we're going to go do this. So we got to get from that mental creation into physical action. And a physical action is one step, one phone call, one email, one follow-up. It's like, this is what I want to do. Who can help me do it? But we get caught in this, uh, I call it keeping the trains running. Got to get up, keep the trains running, man. So we don't pursue the bigger goals, the, the NBO, the next big opportunity, mm -hmm. because we're stuck. We're caught in that trap, right? Mm hmm Kiyosaki called it the rat race, which is a great term. And the reason it caught is because most people just caught up in the rat race, man. Mm -hmm. They get home, they're tired. They got this to go do. They get that. They don't have enough energy to even pursue a big uh, NBO, next big opportunity. Here's Smith Financial Services. We take care of small business owners, 1099 contract workers, and their families. We know insurance can be rough if you're a small business owner. So we are here to make things easy. Visit our website, smithfinancial.services to learn more. And you've known some of the guests that we've had in here. And we've had some some of the people you mentioned and Brad and different things. But, you know, I, as a coach, and I'm sitting back watching you guys as a baseball coach. Mm -hmm. And I started messaging Brad about closer school because I also had a used car lot. I've done some different things and I've managed businesses. And I'm sitting here going, how do I do this? How do I do this? Yep. And four years ago, I met the guy running this thing right now because we did a baseball showcase during COVID when coaches couldn't come see players. So we rented a field. We put cameras on the field. Okay. We rented it as a webinar. Okay. So the college coaches could sit and have a recording of what these kids did. Interesting. Yep. We were the first people in Alabama to do it. California yep. beat me with perfect game baseball, did it before me. Okay. But we went to a field that wasn't being used because of COVID. So a brand new minor league park in Madison, Alabama, Okay. We rented it for a day, Yep. brought 40 kids, kept it small, charged enough so we could just see how it would go, and it turned into something cool. Well, then after COVID, they could come again, so we didn't have the need for that. But that's how I met the guy who now helped me build this. Yep. And then we get around guys like you and Brad and these other people and Nick, and, and they're like, you know, when I leave here, Nick said, you better stop by because we got to talk about the next big thing. Yep. And I'm like... But I hadn't even started the thing you told me last week. And he's like, that's fine. Yeah. We got to stay moving yeah. forward. So by me doing some things and making decisions that I didn't know was going to put me in this position. But it's really cool when I tell you this, to tell you four and a half years ago, a little over four years ago, when he and I were sitting around planning the baseball event. Yeah. We're sitting there going, hey, have you seen this guy, Bradley? Have you seen this guy, Coach Burt? Man, wouldn't it be cool yep. to sit down and talk to those guys one day? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Stu, give me a thumbs up back there. for See? And it's yep. like, that's the conversation we had in his office yep. just over four years ago. Yeah. I had no idea. How am I going to get Coach Bird to come hang out with me? 
Yeah. Uh, how? <laughs> we'll build this and go up there and park here and yeah. talk to Jana yep. and we'll figure it out. Yep. Right? How do I get Bradley in here? Well, Brad, I got a studio in a, ch a what? I got to see that, man. I got to see it, right? So you do something. That's right. So this is a long time coming. Yep. You know what I mean? And this is where we're sitting back now going, okay. We've done all these things. Okay, God, give us what, what, what we're not there yet. Yeah. Right? So when you're coaching people and you're seeing that they're doing this and, and it's like, really, ultimately, you're just giving them the structure, right? Yep. You're just giving them the, the well, map. Yeah. The other the other thing I think I'm giving them, which, I, which is getting more and more prevalent or more and more obvious to me, is the remarkable boldness they need. Okay? Now, let me give you an example. Uh... There's five habits of the top 1% of performers. I talk about this in my book, Flip the Switch. I'm fascinated by it because a lot of people want to play at a high level and they're like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, okay, what are the habits of the top performers? Remarkable boldness, intrinsic motivation, connection, uh, grit and resilience, and ability to lock in and see something through to its conclusion, okay? If, you, if I had to give my kids one of those, which one would I give them? It's tough, right? Because mm -hmm. every study in the world shows that grit and resilience it's really where it's the most successful people have. But when you step back and really think about it, the people who do the big things have a boldness about them that is striking. So striking fearlessness, mm -hmm. right? So let me give you an example. I'm a big fan of a guy named Price Pritchett. Pr Pritchett wrote U Squared, Quantum Thinking. He's, you know, I think probably in his 70s. He's a, he's a psychologist, worked at the Pentagon, left there, executive recruiting. And so he writes these little books. And there's something about the way he writes these books that gets you thinking anything's possible, right? Quantum thinking is things jump, like particles jump with ease. It's not hard. Mm -hmm. It's not like I got to go here and I got to grind it out. And I got to, like, that's what people tell you. You got to build one greatness factory. You got to show it can make money. Then you got to build two. And then, it, like, man, that sucks. Mm -hmm. Could I license it where, there, where people want them? Could I partner with someone who could scale it? Could I... Could I just go over to Cool Springs and say, man, I'm opening one over here too? Mm -hmm. Could I come to Madison, Alabama and open one? Could I come wherever? Yes. So I go, I, I was in Dallas last week and I reached out to Price Pritchett's office and I said, I'm going to be in town. I'd love to meet with Price. Right. And they go, okay, he's available at 10 o'clock. I go over, I drive over from Fort Worth. I spend an hour with him. He said, I've been looking at your website, man. You're doing all these big things. I'm impressed. He's like, we took this meeting because I can tell you're doing things. Right. And I said, how many people do you think have read the, read your book? You squared hundreds of thousands, if not millions. I said, how many people have reached out to you to actually meet you? <laughs> Hardly any. Yeah. I said, that is remarkable boldness. The only thing, the only, I mean, all he could have told me was no, but he said yes. Now we're talking about partnerships. Now we're talking about him speaking at my conference. Now we're talking, you see where I'm going? Yeah. So people read books and people see people and they go, I can never get access to that dude. I and mean, he's too busy being fabulous, and whatever. The truth is I started a lot of my business just like you. I had a radio show on the Fox News affiliate, which is AM station in Nashville, WLAC. Probably didn't have 200 listeners, but every week I would interview people and Cardone, Nito Cobain, Marcus Lemonis. And it's like, man, I got this show on the Fox News affiliate, right? That's all I had to say because mm -hmm. they thought that's big time. Yeah. They didn't know it was on AM station <laughs> and uh, I was going to Antioch, Tennessee. <laughs> and um, nobody's listening. It's Sunday afternoon at one o'clock. <laughs> but what I, when I said, man, I just had Cardone, I just had Grant Cardone last week. They're like, really? I said, yeah. I said, man, you know, I had Marcus Lamonis on. He's on The Prophet the week before that. I had Nito Cobain, president of High Point University. And they go, oh, I got to be on that show. And every Sunday, I would spend an hour with some of the biggest people in the world. Yeah. This was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And then at the end, I'd say, man, I'd love to do something with you. Mm -hmm. Let's follow up and let's do something together. And some of them said, right? Now, it looks that looks innocent. It's like nothing's happening. Fast forward seven years. Because of that, I'm speaking on a stage at 10X, Mandalay Bay, 10,000 people. We generate $2 million. Cardone says, I want you to come to Riviera Maya, Mexico and do this event with me, 75 people. And guess who was there? Brad Lee. Mm -hmm. That's where I met Brad Lee. Okay. Riviera Maya, Mexico, 2014, right? We didn't talk much. I didn't know if I liked him or didn't like him. Yeah. 
And then he came to Nashville after that, and I invited him to dinner. And we went to dinner for three hours, and we argued for three straight hours. <laughs> Because he's contrarian, right? Everything I'd say, he'd say uh -huh. back. I mean, okay. we fought for three. I'm like, this is the most intense dinner I've ever been to. Because everything I'd say, he would just counter. And I think he was testing me. And then we got finished. I had this sprinter, this real nice sprinter. We went out and looked at it. And he said, boy, I sure do like you. We should be doing business together. Yeah. And there you go. That's my story about Cardone and Bradley and all those yeah. people. Because, because, because 10X introduced me to Ed Milet, to Frisella, to Tim Story to Tim Grover, who I became good friends with. Yeah. See, it all started with a little radio show in Nashville on the Fox News affiliate, AEM station, Sunday afternoons, working that muscle, man. Mm -hmm. Working the muscle. Getting better. What's, what What does what does Coach Burt do for fun? What, what is that? What do you do what for is fun? fun? Winning. <laughs> so the truth is, a lot of people, I don't have a lot of hobbies like people would think. Okay. I like freedom tomorrow I have no schedule I got nobody to coach I can do what I want to I may want to work I may want to ride into the bookstore I may want to write a new book I may want to ride my bike four times I may want to work out twice I'm a creative being the worst thing you could do to me is overbook me where I'm just got to deliver over and over and over the best thing you could do for me is to say, you know what, we're going to give this dude a day off and let him go be Coach Burke. Whatever he wants to do, and I'll come up with a $10 million idea if I'm free. So to me, fun is is freedom. Mm -hmm. you got to think, for, for years, I worked 80 hours a week as a coach for 13 years, started this business, worked 80 hours a week, right? Now I'm at a point where it's like, okay, what do I want to do? I need some space. I need some margin. I need some I need some space to think. I need some space to work on a deal that I see. I need some space to work on a big partnership. So on my days off, I don't really like sit around or lay around. Mm -hmm. I literally may go work out twice and just get everything going, right? And then I'll have an idea and and then poor Jana, I'll send them to her and she probably gets 30 or 40. She's like, God, I hate when he has a day off. <laughs> but but the truth is, then it's like she's my integrator. So now it's like, okay, Jana, this is where I want to go. Right? And I'm working on deals, man, that could be so big. They're really game-changing deals. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I need to give this one more attention. I need to give this person more attention. I need to give that person more attention. And so that's fun to me. Exactly. Well, and one reason I ask is because I've been to, a few times I've been to, to Brad's, and I've been to that room in a training class. A few times I've been to the Greatness Factory. Yeah. There's something that both of you guys did. You were both there when I got there. Yep. And you were both there when I left. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking back, yeah. and I brought that up to, to people that I'm coaching and helping right yep. now on a small scale. And I said, guys, Coach Bird was there yep. when I got there, yep. and he was there when I left. Yeah. And they were like, oh, what time did you leave? I said, I think I was like, I think Mike told me to leave. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I think Mike said, hey, yep. it's time. Yep. And I was like, but this is cool. Like, so if you guys are still doing that. Yeah. You know, you're not, oh, I need to go home. I need yeah. to go do this. Yeah. The execution's there. And I still see that there's no fluff in your coaching stories. There's right. no fluff there right. because right. you're still doing it. Yeah. And really and truthfully, you know, Brad sat in here and talked for a couple hours that day and he said, man, I need to get back on the throttle somewhere. I'm just playing too much, you know, doing this, doing that. But yeah. then when I see him work, it's different, right? I mean, yeah. in you. It's like, I could see y'all having an argument for three hours, though. Well, it's, we, it's we, we, we argued about being a person of interest. Yeah. Because I've always made this statement, I've never met a lazy person of interest. Okay. And he goes, well, I'm lazy. <laughs> and I'm a person of interest. And, and, I, and I go, no. What I see is you working on Saturday and Sunday and being at the office and getting up at 4.30 or 5 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. I said, you may not work like I do. Right? There's a pace and an intensity yes. I go at that's yes. different. Mm -hmm. But he's still working, mm -hmm. okay? And so he works different than I do. So there's no right or wrong. I'm a grinder. I get in there. If I'm not doing something, man, I pick up this phone, and I'm like, I got to call. I got to get on the phone call somebody. I got to put a deal together. I got to do this. Like, I'm still in that mode mm -hmm. of building. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll go out there and sit with him, and we'll sit there for hours, and then he wants to smoke a cigar, and 
it's like, what, what, when do y'all work here? You know what I'm saying? But this is work. Yeah. Because the truth is, in his model, people go out there, they see his office, they talk, and somewhere business happens. Mm-hmm. You're either going to go into real merchants, you're going to go into his insurance company. You see where I'm going? Mm-hmm. Business is happening and exchanging, mm-hmm. but it's different than the way I think about work, which is I got to create something, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like when in doubt, take an action. Right. We never just sit. We never, and it's probably as I get older, probably something I'll get better at of enjoying. You know, I have moments of enjoyment. I'd say moments of happiness. Yeah. It's like, man, I built this. Man, I've got, you know, this. Or, man, I've done this. Or, man, I didn't know that, right? Like, my buddy always gives gives me a hard time. He's my buddy Tommy Davidson once because I call. He's like my best friend. And I was having a bad day, and I called him, and he goes, gosh, I know it, man. It's it's tough. And then he said, you got, I mean, he said, how many houses? You got four houses, right? And he said, you got that private jet, and you got that big lodge, and you got that great inspector. He said, gosh, it must suck yeah. to be you. <laughs> It must suck to be you, coach. Yeah. And, and he's a guy who will say, what are you whining about, yeah. man? What more do you need? Yeah. But it ain't about those things, really, to me, to be honest with you. I, it's, I'm, I am miserable when I'm not pursuing something. I get it. I get it. Because I, I know I've, I've ran a full marathon one time just to do it. And like you said, and, I, and I'm, I'm still sitting back learning. I'm sitting here observing everything. But I know when I finished that marathon, it was kind of like, okay, what's next? Yeah. Like, okay, it's over. Yay, we took a picture with my buddy that drove me there. Yeah. And then we went, and I think I ate two baskets of those rolls at, like, Roadhouse <laughs> and a big steak. <laughs> Those some good rolls, man. Yeah. And I had a great day. Yep. And, you know, but I haven't done another marathon or anything. It just was, you know, but it's like you, you go through the process, you go through these things, and even if, you know, you fail, yeah. you learn, yeah. right? And then you keep figuring it out. So yeah. um, what is, you know, I've heard you in Miami, uh, maybe last, early wow. through last year. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I was down there with an insurance group at that okay. point. Um, heard you down there. Saw your, your I don't think the, the table they had set up for you, nobody had got there yet. Yep. But I knew that you knew Brad, and I was trying to make the connection. I just yep. missed you that day. Yeah. Um, but in somebody like in in my case, okay, I'm a coach. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm taking these steps, and I've got my GPS. I've got my destination. We're, we we know where we want to go. But sometimes it's like you know, do I find you know? There's a lot of coaches out there, and they're they are what they are. But you've been there, done that. But if I want to get to where you are and I'm at, you know, this level and hiring a coach or looking at it, we understand it's an investment. We understand it's an opportunity. Yeah. I understand that you're going to take obstacles and make them opportunities. You're going to do a lot of things to do that. But if somebody was just watching this show and they were like, hey, what would coach tell me? How would I get in touch? How does this happen? Yeah. You know, how do I go find Coach Bird at the Greatness Factory? What would they do? To, well, the, to fir- the first thing is to get intensely curious about doing it. Mm-hmm. I saw Ed Milet give a talk in uh, Salt Lake City once. It was me and Milet and Grover were the three speakers. Pretty damn good. It's a pretty, pretty good damn lineup, good lineup. Coach. And he was, he, it was door to door salesman. And the stage was way back here and the people were way out there. It's a very odd speaking situation because all the lights were on you. You couldn't see people. So you're up on stage, you feel isolated, and you can't, they're, they're way back there. And, and for some reason, Milet thought, that people weren't taking notes. And he became furious at the audience. Yeah. And he kept talking about dabbling. Man, y'all are dabbling with your potential versus deciding, right? Don't be casual with your potential. Right. And, and who are you think you're not, you know, I'm up here and I'm over $500 million and you can't take a freaking note? I mean, he just lost it on mm-hmm. these people. Mm-hmm. But the but the point, and I texted him afterward and I said, it's one of the best talks I've ever seen you do. And he said, man, I got all worked up and I'm sorry and I shouldn't got worked up like that and I cussed too much. And I said, man, too many people are casual with their potential. Yeah. If you want to do something, whether it be a coach like me, you you get intensely curious and you go seek out people who know how to do it. And you say, this is what I want to do. Right. And you get in a room with them and you 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 put you flip the you know, for a guy like you, you flip it. You go back to your player mindset. 
You put your player mindset on. Like the coach needs a player. The mm-hmm. symbiotic relate. There's a symbiotic relationship between the coach and the player. And if the player's not coachable, the coach can't get them to that level. And so that's what people need to do. They need to go look. I need to go find Coach Burt. I, I was telling Antoine on the way over here. I am a specialist at activating prey drive. There's no way you're not going to want to do bigger things when you're around a guy like me. Mm-hmm. It's going because I know how to go deep inside of, 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 of your heart, and activate that drive. Right. Mm-hmm. I know how to build competitive intelligence in teams. I'm talking build stone cold killers. I know how to package intellectual property for monetization. These are my skill sets. I can't cook. I'm geographically illiterate. If the tire on this thing went down, I'd be calling somebody. Gotcha. It wouldn't be me fixing it. Okay. <laughs> but my, but in my zone of genius. For some reason, this is where the good Lord has gifted me my gifts. You with me? Mm-hmm. I can take a person and go, okay, let me show you how to package your skill. Let me show you how to make money with this skill. Because I don't believe you just need to find your why and everything will work out. I really don't. I've tried it. And, and, I, and I, I think Simon Sinek's a smart dude. I know yeah. a lot of people get defensive when I talk about this. But I think he had a great concept that people locked on to. I think he's a brilliant guy. But, I, but when I read those books, I still walk away going... Could I know my why and be broke? Could I know my purpose and not be motivated today? I know that God put me on earth to coach people, right? It's all I've ever done since I was 15. Mm -hmm. There's days I don't feel like coaching people. Mm -hmm. There's days I go, man, I've been doing this for three decades, right? I should be, I should have a seat at a bigger table. So I don't think finding your why is a solution. I think finding your skill, step one, finding the problem you would like to solve, step two. Packaging the skill, step three. Marketing the skill, step four. So if you say, I'm a coach, okay, what kind of people are you coaching? What problem are you solving for them, right? There's too many life coaches. There's too many motivational coaches. It's saturated, right? Mm -hmm. So now what we have to do is become specialist, okay? I'm a specialist at, like I just told you my specialization. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm on the phone with the person, I'm like, man, there's nobody better than me at packaging an idea to make money with it. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Nobody better at activated prey drive than me. Nobody studied it in humans like I have. So I trademark all these things because mm-hmm. it's like I, this is this is my zone of genius. My lead has his zone of genius. Cardone, Bradley, they all are good at their deal. And you have to find what that is for you and who would pay you the most money for that. Mm-hmm. Right mm-hmm. now, I found out that companies would pay me a fortune, but I didn't I didn't enjoy doing it. I didn't enjoy going into a company, getting a bunch of people who didn't want to be motivated, motivated. So I go, what if they paid for it themselves, the individual? That's called psychological demand. So I shifted the model where people pay for it themselves, all right? And guess what? I don't have bad attitudes when they pay for it themselves, right? Unless they're at very low levels. And they, and they, and they, they, they haven't figured it out yet. Everything's a big deal to a person paying $97 a month that all they got is $97. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I lived in a two-bedroom condo. I've been broke. Yeah, You understand what I'm saying? I know what it means. Mm-hmm. But also, I didn't stay there. Mm-hmm. So I don't, have a lot of emp- I don't have a lot of empathy for people who stay there mm-hmm. and whine about it. Like, if you don't like being at that level, then let's go get you to another level. It is available to you, <laughs> right? Yeah. Don't complain about it. Yeah. Do something about it. Yeah. One of the things I liked that Brad said, I heard him say one time, he said, you know, a lot of people don't like the level that they're at. They complain about the house they're in, the car they drive, but they won't let go of it and go for it. That's right. And they would rather sit in it. And I'm like, that's right. Wow, you know. And well, it kind, you know, it, that's part of the reason we're doing what we're yeah. doing now. But the like, real problem is they don't have the confidence in themselves that they can make it work. Yeah. So think insecurity mm-hmm. without confidence, confidence, memory of success, boldness, striking fearlessness. So a lot of my coaching is becoming instilling a remarkable boldness in people to go for it. Yeah. And that boldness is evident to me for a little bit of feedback here. When I heard the money lap, yeah, I thought hmm. that takes and, and that takes some balls to call it that in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. It's like, hey, if you go in there, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We're talking about money. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking and, about monetization. But that's kind of, you know, well, I don't know if I should talk about it right away. We need to build this program. We need to talk about this. You're like, okay, yeah, this is where we're working on this skill. That's right. And it is a skill. It Monetization is, is a it skill. Is. So how many talented people cannot figure out how to make money? And so, you know, I grew up going to a church of Christ in Tennessee. We'll never talk about money. No. Right? Even it. to this day, it. me and my own mother don't talk about money. Okay. Okay? And it's like, we don't talk about that. 
Now, mom don't, she don't mind staying at some of the houses I got. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, those houses cost money, mom. Yeah. And that money came from me working my ass off yeah. for a long time. Yeah. So it's like, you know, we can't have one without the other. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's like, those are things that are taboo, especially in the South and the Bible Belt. We don't talk about it. But, but money is a piece of paper. It's created by the government. It's exchanged between people who create value for each other. If you can just change how you see it, it's not as hard to get as we think if we can create real value for people. You see where I'm going? And a lot of people never had that course. If they had that course, which I didn't have, right. I mean, I didn't even know the difference between an asset and a liability at 31 years old. When I live being a basketball coach, <clears throat> I go, I need to grow my financial intelligence. Mm-hmm. So I went down and I bought a book called How to Grow Your Financial IQ by Robert Kiyosaki and Sharon Lecter. Now, what's funny is fast forward seven, 10, 12 years, I'm sitting having dinner with Sharon Lecter at her house, yeah. and she wrote that book, How wow. to Grow Your Financial IQ. She wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad for Kiyosaki. She wrote the first 10 books. So it's like I went from emulating these people to sitting at the table with these people. And that is something everybody should try to do, cultivate that skill to be at, the, at a bigger table. Mm-hmm. Well, Coach, I know that we've, we've scheduled this time. And obviously, <laughs> I'm going to respect your time. But is there anything that you have upcoming that people need to know about? Is there anything that we need to cover today? Well, I'd stay all day with you if Jana would let me, but she won't. <laughs> she won't let me because i got to go do this again somewhere else. I understand. Um, but, this, but I think, man, I think we've covered a lot of good things. Mm-hmm. I think um, what you're doing is you're getting in the game. And you're getting around people mm-hmm. who know how to play the game, mm-hmm. right? Right. Now it's like pick your NBO, yep. your next big opportunity, yep. and pursue it yep. with a passion and an intensity, right? And then the monetization, how do you mind? Because as soon as I walk in this place, I'm like, oh, yeah, man, this could be monetized. Every conference in America, people would pay money to have these things built, right? Because like I said, you go to a conference, they're doing it in some dumpy hotel room. It's not set up correctly. You know, and the reason I give things names is because you can identify with it. When yeah. you name something, it becomes valuable. Money Lab, mm-hmm. Dream Foundry, Level Ten Podcast Studio. You see where I'm going? It's oh, like yeah. the Greatness Factory. It, it it gives it makes it important to valuable to other people. So, Absolutely. You know, I think people out there that are looking for a coach, I'm you know, that's what I do. And you do a damn good job. Thank of you. It. You do. Thank you. You do, which is evident, and it's you know, you got the numbers, the stats to yeah. show for it. Um, Coach, I'm, I'm going to say again, thank you yep. for your time because I'm going to be selfish and I think I'm going to watch this show over and over and I over. I hope so. Okay. I'm loving it, but I'll be back to talk to you in person. I love it. All right. I love Coach, it, brother. Thank you. Thank you. I owe you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Podcast on Wheels.